There comes a time Hello and welcome to the second of our Southwest Area Services. I'm Sarah, this is South for Good and we lead the Plymouth Vineyard. Yeah, it's great to have you tuning in for our service this morning. Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Leanne I'm from Truro and we lead the Three Rivers Vineyard. Super warm welcome from us here at Falmouth Vineyards. I'm Ruth. And I'm Nathan. It is great to be with you wherever you are joining from this morning. Hi, we are Dave and Sarah from Exeter Vineyard Church. Hi guys, this is Jude. This is John. And we're from Tiverton Vineyard. Hi, I'm Hendrik. I'm Leone. And together we lead Yeovil Vineyard Church and it is our privilege to share this time with you this morning across the region. Hello Vineyard family, we're Simon and Rachel and we lead Taunton Vineyard. We're really looking forward to this time where we can all be together across our area. And um, we're going to, it's our great delight to lead into worship now um, just by praying for us. It's, it's our privilege, isn't it, to be able to come so intimately into Jesus's presence in worship. And that's what we're going to do now. So let's just prepare our hearts. And I just pray, come Holy Spirit, come and move now mightily in the homes and uh, the lives of those who are tuning into this this morning. And as we worship you, Jesus, and we give you our thanks and our praise this morning, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and um, dwell in the praises of your people. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen.
what a year it's been. In amidst the change, the disruption, the pain and the suffering and the loss, there have also been incredible opportunities for us to be the church and extend the kingdom of God within our communities. Arthur and Sarah have just asked me to give a tiny introduction on the theme of vision and specifically around taking the opportunities that we are presented with as we start to emerge from lockdown and return to something that more closely resembles life uh, before lockdown. For me, this is a two-part opportunity. We are going to be presented with opportunities to share the hope, life, peace, forgiveness, reconciliation and transformation that is part of the good news of Jesus. And these are going to be individual opportunities that you can respond to by yourself or with your family. But they may also be opportunities that you can respond to as a small group or even as a whole church. We are going through um, a series on the book of James at the moment at church. It's incredibly challenging and super practical. James um, chapter 2 verse 15 just says this. Suppose a brother or sister in Christ comes to you in need of clothes or something to eat. And you say to them, God be with you. I hope you stay warm and get plenty to eat. But you don't give them the things they need. If you don't help them, your words are useless, worthless. Verse 17, it is the same with faith. If it is just faith and nothing more, if it doesn't do anything, it's dead. And as vineyard churches, we don't only want to know the stuff, we want to do the stuff. During lockdown, here in Falmouth, we've started the Grow Baby Project. <clears throat> we started to take donations of new and second-hand equipment, clothes and toys for children from newborn up to the age of five. The vision is that no child under five should go without. It's super simple. So we started to build a team, find somewhere to store and distribute the donations, and then started spreading the news to social workers, health professionals, and on Facebook. Now, because of lockdown, we weren't able to do the normal stay and play part of the project, where the community is built and developed. But we didn't allow that to stop us helping um, families in need and praying for every person that came to collect equipment. A vision is birthed where you find that you are completely frustrated, maybe even broken hearted, possibly even angry about the way things are in the light of the way you believe things could be. You can see a different preferred future. Vision is a clear mental picture of what could be fueled by the conviction that it should be. So with Grow Baby it's, Baby, it's simple. No child under five should go without the equipment, clothes and toys to enable them to thrive in the Falmouth area. And because of this, we will give our time, energy, money and resources to make it happen. So vision is powerful because it involves emotion. It's not something that's nice to have. It is birthed out of heartbreak. Vision is powerful because it provides motivation the drive to see it done. I bet you can think of something you've achieved because you had the vision to see what could be. The vision provided the motivation for you to get it done. And vision is powerful because it provides clarity and direction. If you get on a bus, masked up and sanitised, um, the destination of the bus is displayed on the front. You know where it's going. Vision allows us to keep on track and measure whether we are doing what we said we were going to do and not be distracted by the good things that we're not called to. Lastly, vision is powerful because it gives purpose. Now, I'm guessing that if you've been involved in church any amount of time, you will have been invited to join either the setup team or the welcome team. Maybe not in the last year, but before that. Now, if I say to someone, we really need some help <clears throat> putting the chairs out on a Sunday morning, could you do me a favour and help me out? That is not vision. If you think it is, that might be why your team has not grown. I wrote a vision statement for each of our Sunday teams. Here's the one for the um, setup team. The setup team will create an environment that is distraction free, where adults and children can experience God's presence and meet Jesus. Do you want to get involved? Does the setup team put out chairs? Yes, it does. But they are doing this to facilitate someone else potentially encountering God for the first time. So my challenge would be, what vision is God giving you for your life, for your family, for your small group, for your community? And how are you going to partner with God to see it happen? If it's a godly vision, it will part inspire you and part scare you. And it won't succeed without your courage 
and the power of God. So let's hear some stories from around the Southwest that involve us taking the opportunities that have been provided by the current situation to extend God's kingdom. So this last year, like everyone else, we've had to change from having people in a room every week, everyone all together. So that's been the biggest challenge. And I think, you know, there's so much, uh, you get so much feedback about people's engagement and connectedness and a sense of being uh, the church on a journey together when you can meet every week. And that's been a massive change for us. So something we, kind of something that we thought was important but never really prioritised was how do we fully equip or try to equip people to connect themselves to God, not by being part of a collective service, but just to pursue God on their own. Yeah, so equipping the church in this way is obviously the purpose of the church in the first place. And for us, it afforded a great opportunity because that's something we've been looking at for the last few years anyway. So. So what we've done uh, since we've kind of not been able to meet physically together is alongside our talks, we decided that we wanted to learn how to do some spiritual disciplines uh, and continue these um, alongside our, our content that we were doing in, in our Sunday online services. So the first one we started with was meditation, which has been great. And something that occurred to me is if we were doing a, a sermon series on spiritual disciplines, we would have done week one, meditation, week two, Lectio Divina, week three, fasting, week four, imaginative prayer, week five, standing on one leg. I mean, whatever spiritual disciplines you wanted to do. But what we kind of, without really thinking it through, we just thought, well, let's just for this whole series that we're doing at the moment, up to Easter, do meditation. And it's actually been really good because it's meant that we've stuck with this one thing all the way through. Mm. And then because we are all connecting with an online service and then in smaller groups uh, meeting together on Zoom, we've been able to be in accountable relationships and ask each other, how is your meditation going? You know, how can I pray for you? And let's discuss how we do that together. And it's felt more of a learning journey, which has been really good. Because one thing that... I've realised, and I think a lot of people realise, is actually we are really rubbish at meditating. This idea of just shutting off from distractions and uh, stimulation and instead just opening a space to be present with God is incredibly hard. So we've just put a challenge of like trying to spend five minutes a day in a quiet space and inviting God in. And it's just so hard because your mind wants to do other things. And that's why it's been great not just to have one week to give it a few goes and then try something new, but to stick on this for a while. So I think this new opportunity, the way that church has had to be uh, altered and we've needed to rethink things has really helped us think, how do we actually learn skills and tools to help all of us connect with God a bit better? So this last Christmas um, appeal that we did had an amazing uh, response from the public. It just seemed to capture the public's um, imagination this year. Um, with so many people needing food and help over Christmas and so many people wanting to find something to do to help. So we do a Christmas box appeal every year where we invite people to put together a box of food that will be enough to feed a family of four to six. And it's all non-perishables and people put it in boxes and they leave it at collection points all over Cornwall. And then one day we go around and we pick them all up. And this year we more than doubled the amount of boxes that we've done in the past. We were over 3,000 boxes this year, which was just an incredible um, response. Just God pouring out his blessing in this time. Say that again, how many? Over 3,000 boxes. <laughs> we didn't hear that, say it again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm trying to be all serious and professional. <laughs> How many? 3,250, I think it was, in total. It was a lot of... And the year before that, we'd done 1,000... Not quite 1,500. So it was absolutely huge. It was amazing for us. And I think we're really excited because we are a church of about 20 people, 20 to 30, if you're counting adults. Um, and so we're just amazed by what God can do with just a few willing people. Yeah, it's okay. absolutely incredible. That's us. That's us. The reading today is from 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 2 to 10. The faith of Thessalonian believers. We always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly. 
As we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. And you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit, in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. As a result, you have become an example to all the believers in Greece throughout both Macedonia and Asharia. And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Asharia. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it, for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living and true God. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. The Vineyard's vision statement, extending God's kingdom together in every way. I love that statement. It puts into words everything that the vineyard is about. And my journey into vineyard was actually, probably like many people's, a bit of an accident. I was uh, in a small group uh, to do with the Christian Union at the University in Southampton and this core group of uh, five of us carried on meeting together after we graduated and the Christian Union small group closed. And we found incredible um, relationship together and the Holy Spirit came into our lives and came into our meetings. Uh, we invited a few more people and gradually this thing grew. We were reading the New Testament, the book of Acts, uh, Paul's letters. We were just getting really into it and just wanting to live that life, sort of translate that life, that sense of urgency of the kingdom into our lives in Southampton in the late 20th century. And as people uh, came and joined us and we grew and we learned about healing, we just started doing the stuff and we were making it up as we went along. Uh, there was uh, some church leaders in Southampton um, spoke to us and said, you really need some sort of an accountability going on here. You need a covering. You need to align yourself with a, with a church. So we uh, one of us had connections in St Albans Vineyard with Chris and Fliss Lane and they, uh, he went up there, this was Matt Heim who's still the, the pastor, the lead pastor of Southampton Vineyard uh, today and he, uh, we became adopted as a kinship with the, with the St Albans Vineyard uh, but even so we were just making it up as we went along. We were trying to get, we were trying to learn from the books, we went to the conferences, uh, Chris came down and spoke and helped us and pointed us in the right direction. But it really felt like spontaneous expansion of the church. It was very, very exciting. We made a lot of mistakes. It cost us a lot. Uh, looking back, you know, there were some brilliant times, but there were some tough times as well. Uh, and it just integrated into a vineyard church. And as I say, it's still going today. Uh, we were planted out. We were moved up to Winchester and then planted out from Winchester here to Plymouth. So... The reason I mentioned this story is it resonates with me when I read the story of the Thessalonian church. So we were reading from the uh, epistle to the Thessalonians. Uh, this was the first letter that was written by Paul. It was really exciting. Um, and also it was written into a church that had a pretty chaotic start. And it reminded me of our start. Not that we were in any way comparable with the Thessalonian church, but... There were some things that, uh, that reminded me of our experience. For a start, it was a very chaotic situation. There were no experienced leaders. Uh, in their situation, there were no written texts of Jesus. I'm just looking at the, the timeline here. The first gospel, uh, which was the gospel of Mark, probably dates from about AD 66 to 67. 
and all of this was going on in AD 50. So there were no written um, texts and no Gospels other than the Old Testament. So they, I just think it was amazing. The Holy Spirit led them and uh, it gives us hope. It gives us hope that no city is too difficult. We're going to hear about some of the challenges that they had in Thessalonia. No situation was too hard. God's kingdom is going to advance, often despite us, often with us. Uh, he builds his church and, uh, and we can have faith that this is something that God is doing and we are cooperating with him. So let's have a look at the brief story of the church uh, of Thessalonica. Uh, and then I'm going to draw out three points from it. So Paul and Silas went there and they started preaching in the synagogue. As was their habit, they were doing it for three Sabbaths. So they were there for three weeks and they saw people turn to Jesus, some Jews and some Greeks. Uh, they were meeting in people's houses. It was going really, really well until some of the Jewish people from the synagogue started to resent what was going on. Maybe they were looking over the road and seeing all this life uh, and this, uh, this faith. And maybe they were a bit jealous. I don't know. Um, or maybe they felt that it was a threat to, to their beliefs and their religion and their way of doing things. But whatever happened, they created this riot situation. They probably went down to the market, stirred a few troublemakers up. And uh, they raided Jason's house. Jason was one of the uh, leaders, that one of the converts from, that Paul and Silas sort of gathered and got into leadership. Bear in mind, this is only three weeks old, so it's you know, early days. Uh, anyway, they couldn't find Paul and Silas in, the, um, in Jason's house. So instead, they arrested Jason. They, put him, uh, uh, they publicly accused him before he went on bail, and he had to bail himself out, so he was out of pocket there. And uh, Paul and Silas escaped the city. And that was it. The Thessalonian church was then left to thrive and survive, or, or not, as the case may be. Uh, in this case, we see that they did thrive. I really feel for Jason. You know, he's, he's been a three-week-old convert, selected by Paul for leadership. He's thinking, great, I'm going to learn from Paul, you know, and he's going to teach me everything he knows. Uh, and then before you know it, boom, Paul and Silas are out of there. He's a few quid down. He's minus his, his leaders and his founding plas, planters. And he's leading in this church, in this city that now hates Christians. Uh, it's not a very auspicious start, is it? And none of them have had any training. There's no online training. They don't have the Vineyard Training app. They don't have Hub. They don't have all the resources that we've got our hands on. Uh, and it's just up to them and the Holy Spirit to work it out from there. Uh, the task that they had was by no means an easy one either. They were calling people to give up their old way of life, which whether it was in uh, Judaism and their adherence to the Jewish uh, religion in the synagogue, or whether they were Greeks with their, their sort of uh, worship of, of gods there. Whatever happens, the, if they're going to lay down their idol worship or if they're going to turn their back on the synagogue, they face ostracization from their family. A real cost uh, if they were going to follow the way. That was... Uh, that was what's also this was a uh, worshiping the Lord, you know, saying Jesus is Lord was a direct contravention of the Caesar is Lord that was being propagated there by the Roman military uh, in this outpost in Thessalonica. And you, you don't mess around with the Romans. So that from all sides, there was a real cost and a real risk to anyone who decides to follow the way. As I say, the leaders didn't have any experience. Uh, they didn't have any training. They were new converts. That, they were in a city that hated Christians now. Uh, and how did they do? You know, were they going to survive? Would you expect to survive in that situation? Well, a few years later, Paul sent Timothy uh, to Thessalonica just to see how they're getting on. Can you find any Christians? Is there a church there? And uh, tell, us, tell us how you get on. And he did. And we find that the church had more than survived. It had grown and grown into a viable, healthy, Jesus-centred community of faith. Uh, that's just an amazing amazing report and Timothy after hanging out with them for a while goes back to Paul and says all this and Paul immediately summons a scribe right let's get this letter to the Thessalonians and that's the, the flavour that we get in the early parts of this uh, letter of 1 Thessalonians it's just Paul is so grateful and so excited about what's gone on and um, so it's inspiration for us as well isn't it and God has called us all to, to lead and to push through and to step out in this way. And I, I wonder how you feel about your calling. Do you feel adequately trained? Do you feel like you've got the resources that you need? Do you feel like you're equipped and gifted enough to do the job that God's called you to do? Possibly not. But possibly we can get inspiration 
and encouragement from the story of the Thessalonian church. First of all, three points. The church was strategic and intentional. It was vision-led. Uh, yes, it was chaotic in the way it all panned out, but Paul and Silas, Paul went there with a, with a vision and a strategy. And it's the same thing that he would do in many places. Go into the synagogue, preach there, aim to preach the gospel to as many people as he could in the city, accompanied by signs and wonders, uh, before being turfed out uh, or moving on, or being called out by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and without vision, without strategy, uh, without being intentional, we will drift. We'll, we've got these gravitational pulls towards comfort and towards safety and towards the safe four walls of our home or our church. Uh, and that's why we need the vision. That's why we need to be intentional, because we will always drift into the safety. We'll always drift into the comfort, to those four walls, staying inside safe. That's okay to have that drift. We just need to be aware of it. And strategy and vision and that accountability when we share it with others, that is what keeps us on track and avoids us drifting back into that. So what's your vision for extending God's kingdom? How are you going to expand the kingdom and grow the church where you are? Do you have a strategy? Are you living in an intentional manner? Do you recognise the drifts that I explained? Are you in that place of drift or are you sort of pushing against it? Just some questions to ponder there. Point number two, the church was courageous and it was faithful. I can't imagine what Paul felt when he heard from Timothy that, they'd, that they were still going. You know, they'd taken that, that little input that he'd got and they'd found Jesus. And with the Holy Spirit working in their hearts, they'd kept on going. I just, I just love it. And um, sometimes Paul is slightly hard to relate with. He's like the Christian version of Bear Grylls, isn't he? Or the Brownlee brothers. But Jason and the rest of the Thessalonian church, I can relate to them. Uh, they're accidental heroes, which, as I said, was my story. Uh, but we have got a difference. We've got available to us training, and we've got available to us experienced leaders to help. And we've got available to us a church family network, which gives us structure and it gives us oversight. Uh, so those are great things. We're really well equipped, actually. We've got loads going for us. But what it always boils down to, whether you're in 1st century Thessalonica or 21st century southwest of England, is what it boils down to is we need courage and we need faithfulness to not give up not giving up. Point number three. This story and the book of Thessalonians, it gives us a vision for multiplication. I love the, the growth of the New Testament church in that it's really diverse it's often very small, but always incredibly powerful and resilient against all the odds. The New Testament church is not a picture of this massive great cathedral, this strong authority-based uh, organisational structure from which everything goes out. The church is, is, that we see in the New Testament is, is one of weakness, it's small, it's meeting in people's homes, it's led by lots and lots of little leaders, if you like. And you've got your Pauls and your Silases and your Apollos and a few others. But, but generally, you know, they're not in contact 24-7. They'll just pop in every now and then or you'll get a letter through the post called 1 Corinthians. So it really was about the small guys, the me's and you's, if you like. Following Jesus and, and just following the, the, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Peter was told by Jesus, do you remember, you are Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. What was it that made Peter the rock? Was it his training or his experience? Or was it his gifting? No, it was his character, his love for Jesus and his perseverance. And what was Jesus' vision for the church? It wasn't St Peter's Basilica, the power and the wealth and the influence, the place at the table with the world leaders. I love the modern day St. Peter in the form of all of us, doing our best in a humble way to be Jesus to the world, at work, in our homes, in our neighbourhoods, amongst our friendship networks. And church is a network of local, small, loving and humble 
Jesus' followers who multiply themselves. So, what are you waiting for? Where does God call you to serve right now? Uh, where is God calling you to lead right now? Often, leadership is mostly about serving others and helping stuff to happen. Being available to the Holy Spirit, saying yes to Jesus and following him into the situations where he leads. It's often very, very simple. And along the way we get all the training we can, we get all the support we can, we get all the prayer that we can. And we allow Jesus to transform us from the inside out as we serve. In Plymouth we say you grow as you go. So now I'm going to hand over to Henrik and Leone and to John and Jude and they're going to lead our ministry time for us. Thank you so much to Arthur for sharing that word this morning. Um, it's a real encouragement and we would just love to spend the next few minutes um, in ministry time um, with you. We would really encourage you to stay on and to stay connected and to be in a position and a posture of, of wanting to hear from God. Um, so we would love to pray for you guys now. We would love to um, bring words of encouragement and knowledge um, to you. Um, so let's um, open our hearts and our ears and our minds to God now. I'd just love to start by saying, Father God, we just um, say that we love you. We thank you so much for your presence. We thank you so much that we can draw close. We thank you so much that you are not a distant God, that you um, draw close, that you mm. long to be near. Yeah. And just as we were preparing for the service, I was reminded of the psalm that we're going through with our families at the minute at Tiverton Vineyard, Psalm 139, and it's verse 7. And it talks about us not um, being able to go anywhere where your presence is not, mm -hmm. that we cannot escape your presence and that that should bring us great comfort and great joy. And I pray for anyone this morning who's listening <coughs> um, and tuning in who, who doesn't feel your presence, who mm -hmm. maybe lacks that mm -hmm. um, or doesn't know where to go mm -hmm. to find it. But we know that you give it to us when we come to you, God. Yes. Um, and so I would just encourage people to um, read that psalm. If you're mm. feeling far from God, read that psalm. Um, but that God is near, that he loves you, mm. and that he is near. In mm. Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The first word that, uh, that we've uh, received is uh, just from uh, Acts in the beginning, um, where... Uh, Jesus tells the disciples to, to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the gift uh, of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And, uh, yeah. So the word is basically just to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the gift. And that perhaps, you know, the time that uh, we as churches have been um, unable to really operate like we used to, um, mm. we, in a sense, have been in a state of waiting and uh, and God is saying that we should just remain there for a bit longer and, mm. um, and the blessing will come. Um, another word that came through was um, um, the words today's steps is tomorrow's destination. Mm. And um, I was thinking about this and and I think they are certain things that we hear from the Lord and we receive from the Lord and we know of him, of his love for us mm. and his, the plans that he has for us. But um, I think they, um, they are just some part that we are not really believe and that is that he has a plan for us. Mm. And that he That's has equipped us to do the thing that he has asked us to do. Yes. Um, so it's taking small steps, mm -hmm. baby steps of just stepping forward and saying, yes, Lord, I, I have the heart for that. Mm -hmm. And that's all I have. Mm -hmm. um, it's not your work. It's mm -hmm. the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes. It's God's work and he will do it through you. 
Mm. All you have to do is step forward and take that first baby step forward and Mm. say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We cannot start at the destination. Mm. Um, We have to start at the beginning. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, God's looking for willing hearts, huh? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Lord. I was also reminded of uh, a while back I had an operation and I had to wear this big plaster uh, over part of the wound. Mm. And uh, it was uncomfortable. It was <clears throat> painful. Um, and especially when you, when you have to take it off, you know, that, that tearing off the plaster it, it was mm. quite painful. Mm. And, uh, and I was just thinking about it, that the time that we are in, this time of isolation and seclusion is, in a way, it's a painful time, mm. but it's also a time of healing. Mm. It's a time of healing for all the things mm. that we have made church to be mm. uh, that it should not be. Mm. And uh, so it's, it's really coming back to the heart of mm. worship to the heart of why we meet together as a church mm. and what it means to be a church. Mm. So while there is pain, there is also healing. Mm. And uh, I feel that we are nearing that time where we rip that plaster off for the final mm. time. Mm. We can uh, walk into that future, that, that better future that God has planned mm. for us. That's good. Mm. That's good. That's good. Thank you, God. I just get the picture of a, a, a Lego arm, like a left arm. I had to connect one recently for one of my uh, one of my kids. Um, I just sense uh, God's presence is here and where God's presence is, his, his power is also. And uh, just for healing, I don't know if it's in the left wrist or, or elbow or if it's like a shoulder socket, whatever it happens to be. But if, if that's you, I'd love to uh, just speak healing and health now in Jesus' name. Um, speak alignment into your muscles and ligaments and bones just um just speak god's healing presence god's healing power thank you we we love uh god's presence we love the healings and the 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 signs and the wonders are wonderful but it's it's god's presence uh, that we long for that we desire but just uh, really sense god's presence is here now for for healing and so if that's you just place why don't you just place your hand on 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 that that's um area that's injured or or, or hurting and just speak god's healing there in jesus name mm-hmm. and, and just for for any of these uh, words that are given during this ministry time let's uh, um, use the live chat or, or feedback whatever we've got just to be able to uh, encourage each other in the church as these are, mm-hmm. are coming in we also had a, um, a word um, about bullying, bullying and abuse behind closed doors. Um, if you are one of those who are struggling during this time with abuse and um, physical or just any bullying, it might even be children. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to pray for you right now. Mm-hmm. Mm. Holy Spirit, come. Yes. We just pray into that yes. situation, Lord. We pray for your protection. Yes. And we pray, Lord, that you will um, give that person the, the chance to talk to somebody. Yes. Or to get out of, if it is dangerous, to get yeah. out of that situation. Yes, yeah. yes, Lord. But we call for your presence in, in that situation, Lord. Yes, Lord. Will you make a way, Lord? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We pray for your love, your powerful love. Yes. Into this, that house. Yes, Lord. I feel also there's quite a lot of people who are worried about their financial circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, when you have a wood burner and you see the wood pile 
going lower and lower and you don't know how long the winter is still going to last. Yeah. Um, you know, it can make you nervous about whether you have enough resources. Yes. And I just feel very strongly that God is saying that mm. he is your provider. Yeah. He Amen. will give you your daily bread. Amen. Mm. Mm. Trust in the Lord. Yes, God. Yes, God. Thank you. The word there really ties. In, in the last few hours, I've just been really uh, sensing that there's a number of people that are going to be connecting with us this morning that, that uh, really need to ask for help. And um, now is the time to ask for help. And we need to remember that um, asking for help is not a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's one of the bravest, most courageous things we can do. Mm -hmm. Ask for help is to say, please, can you help me? I'm in a situation where I need help. Asking for help isn't giving up. It's not um, um, giving in to something. In fact, it, it's choosing not to give in. Mm -hmm. it's, choosing, uh, it's choosing to want to move something forward in a better way, in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. um, so just get a, a, a real sense. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just that now is the time. Uh, now is the time to just to ask for help, just mm -hmm. to raise that situation, particularly if... Uh, you're in a, a, an unsafe situation if you're in a, um, a difficult or a situation that you need to uh, uh, tell someone else about or, or share with something now's the time to ask for self, ask for help and it's a brave thing it's a courageous thing to do we'd um we'd so encourage i just get a real sense there's more than um uh, a few people on the on the on with us this morning i need to do that um, but listen, we're going to uh, draw this time uh, to a close now. Um, Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you that you are alive and at work at this time. We thank you that you're not confined by time or location. Um, so just if you're out there, if you're engaging with God now, just don't rush away from this. It's a precious time. It's a precious time. Holy Spirit, we pray you'd increase your work now. Mm -hmm. We pray that you would bring revelation. You would bring healing in a way that only you can do. We thank you so much uh, for this platform of, uh, that we're able to use uh, this morning. Um, we use it uh, for your glory in Jesus' name. Anything anything uh, that's of you this morning, then we give glory back to you. And anything or any words that are just from us, then I pray that they just blow away in the wind, Lord. Uh, but we worship you. We thank you for this time this morning. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless amen. you guys.
tongue or pen can ever tell what goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. Tongue.